afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mr. Iso Kamara, lecturer at Obey College, University of Sierra Leone. Uh, this afternoon, I am here to lecture on design writing. In other words, how to write a dissertation. I'm here to lecture on dissertation writing, how to go about a dissertation. Of course, it's a core model that all students in the university or respective universities are offering. It's a core model and it's so paramount that it has been one of the criteria set by the university for the college. So it's a core model, it's a criteria for you to pass or get your degree. Social research will be more beneficial to the final year students who are presently engaged in writing their final paper or dissertation. So that is why I'm here this afternoon, not to deal with any specific topic in social research, but to give guidelines, criteria, how to go about writing your dissertation. In the first place, Dissertation is quite different from project writing. Always students are confused, even in the university, and even also in other institutions, not necessarily academic. They are so confused with writing a dissertation and that of a project writing. They might be overlap or interrelated, but there are variations or distinctions between them. So I'm here also to clarify some of these doubts. That is why this model will be important to all students in the respective departments. It will also be important for even those at LAB during their final write-up or the final dissertation. Because I am going to look at a dissertation from a social perspective. I will be looking at it to some extent from the legal point of view. That is how to write a legal research. And also social sciences. So it's purely going to be not only a qualitative but quantitative, or what we call triangulations. And it is also what we call an applied research. It's applied research. I'm not only going to look at the theoretical aspect, but I have to also practicalize it. In other words, I will make it so precise for you to understand some of the technicalities or variables that you may consider when you are writing. What is this social research is all about? A social research is just an academic exercise that a researcher or any other person in the academic field has to undertake to accomplish either a term paper or even to accomplish a voluminous book or a research work that has to be published. Dissertation social research is all about an academic exercise, you know, that will be original research, creative by the researcher to produce authentic write-up that may be considered. By writing social research, researchers may also 
they want to explore. All the papers that have been written by scholars, by learners, by philosophers, or even legal researchers. You have to be creative when you are writing a dissertation. Some people are always saying that there is no new dissertation. That is rebutted. There are new dissertations. And you students coming to write a dissertation, you don't have entirely to depend on old dissertations. Your work has to be creative. Innovation, innovative is all what research is about. The definition of uh, social research, it involves creativity, innovation, skills, enhancing your mental ability or capacity. So for you to go and plagiarize or copy directly from a work of somebody else to be submitted in a department, that one is condemned. Your dissertation has to be creative, original. Now, I'm giving you the steps of writing a dissertation. I have to forget about all other segments, for example, taking accounts of your cover page or the appendix or your abstract. I want to deal with the body of a dissertation. How to apply yourself when you are writing. The content of it. What a dissertation contains. I'm looking at it from the theoretical aspect. Then I will also practicalize it so that you will understand better. The content of dissertation here I'm talking about. The outline. An outline of a dissertation. What are the criteria or variables you have to consider when you are writing a thorough and applied dissertation. In the first place, normally you can start with your points. Some people will say 1.1 or 1.0. But it depends. That is discretionary to the lecturer or to your tutor or whosoever is supervising you. You can write 1.1 or 1.0. But what is paramount there with the beginning is the introduction. Where well, there have been so hypothetical views with respect to the introduction and that of the background. I could clarify it. Some people will start with 1.1 and introduction. Some will say 1.1, background of the study. Okay, they are interrelated. Background of the study, introduction, some people will use that one. But I think the new method is we have to accept now is the introduction. Because your introduction entails background of the study. But when if you say if you say background of the study, <laughs> you are limited. But it is preferable to say introduction 1.0. Because the background comes under your introduction. The introduction should not exceed more than two pages. In fact, sometimes I consider it from the standard point, Oxford is two pages. Some people write copiously 10, 20 pages. No, dissertation is not all about its volume. It tells you about the quality of it. So he's writing about 10,000 pages. Sometimes students ask me, how many pages do you think, Mr. Kamara, we are going to? I say, no, I'm looking at the quality of the dissertation. So your introduction, that is your 1.1, 1.0, should not exceed two pages. That is your introduction. And what are some of the essential variables that you can look at when you are giving an introduction of that work. You have to look at so many variables, so many you know, segments in your introduction. In the first place, you can start even by defining the research topic. For example, if you are giving an, um, a research topic, you know, that is all about an examination of the plight you know, of street beggars in the Western or in Freetown, you take a case study, Freetown, is a very good topic. You must have to define street beggars. So always researchers begin with definition of the concept. Defining your research topic or your thesis topic. You have to define it. 
And you are not limited to one definition. You are giving definitions of the topic. Normally, some people will start not with definition. They will give a preamble of the event, looking at the trend, the trend of that particular event. That is how, for example, street beggars, how they struggle in the Western world, how they came about. They can get a synopsis or a preamble or a short history of the event before defining the concept or research topic. But it is appropriate where it depends, but it is appropriate always to start with a definition. The choice is yours. Now, when you have defined that particular research topic, as the case may be, you may now go further to trace, giving a background information of that particular event. For example, if you are talking about street beggars, you can trace it from the Western world, how it all started, how it sparked up. Whether because it was a slave movement in Africa that most of the Africans we are taking to the New World, or we are taking elsewhere, in which after the abolition of the slave trade, some of them started begging in England, etc., etc. You can use something like a synopsis or a background study of that one after the definition. And in the introduction, you have so many gaps that are created in the introduction. It will not be one or two gaps, but there are many gaps. For example, if you are looking at gaps here, we are talking about what are some of the problems that you envisage or you have identified in the research? What are some of the problems? So those are gaps. Those gaps are quite different from statements of the problem when we come there. So when you have defined that particular research topic and you are now given a synopsis or what you call a short history of background of that particular event tracing it, you relate it to the gaps you have identified in your introduction. And however, those gaps you might have identified as a researcher, you look at things. One, after the definition, you look at the causes of your research topic. You may have a topic there. What are the causes or the main causes? Then after that causes, in that same introduction, you have to look at the effect. It could be an appalling effect. It could be an appalling effect. It may be positive or negative. We are looking at the dreadful issues on the society. How that one will affect the society. Then, your introduction will also have what you call a closing remark addressing those gaps or problems. So, your introduction is not supposed to exceed more than two pages. You are not supposed to give subtopics under your introduction. And those give you analysis of it. I say you start with the intro with definition of the research topic. You look at the causes. You look at the effects. Then perhaps you can also draw attention to some of the solutions. All those things should be embraced in the introduction. Not necessarily giving them subtopics. So it should be precise. When the introduction, some people may bring also the views of scholars. And the years also you have to quote that one, but it might not be so much. You don't need to go extensively quoting researchers. Of course, you have to do that, but you are limited. You more do apply that one when you are writing your literature review. That is for chapter two. But it's just a brief introduction, background, or synopsis of the topic sentence you are to write on. That is all about an introduction. Now the format of writing chapter one, where it's not confusing, the criteria are set up. But some, you know, supervisors or your tutor may want certain variables to come before this particular variable. All depends. But I'm giving you a systematic analysis of how you should write a proper squared dissertation. So after your introduction, 1.1 or 1.0, it depends. You go to the next stage. That's the statement of the problem. Statement of the problem. As the name suggests, statement of the problem. That should be another subtopic. In the chapter one I'm talking about, your introduction. Your statement of the problem here is telling you that 
the topic you have chosen or you have identified have certain gaps, specific gaps. For instance, if you are writing about statement of the problem, you may have identified one or two problems that either academic, theoretical, or even practical. Normally, it could be academic gaps you have identified in the research. For example, if you are talking about a research, talking about the plight of what? You know, street beggars in the western area or in free time case study western area. There are certain gaps. Either you can start by saying the concept of street beggar or that concept is, a, is not a new phenomenon. It started in England, for example, in 1787, when Africans were taken as slaves in Af to the New World, there they suffered. And however, in this particular year, there was an abolition to end of slave matter. As a result of that, these slaves came back to Africa to take their original seats. And in the event, there are so many social problems they face. However, in that situation, next paragraph, much research, or you could say little research, has, little research has been done in this particular aspect. That is why you as a researcher, you have identified this one to be a problem. That could be an academic word, a gap you have identified. Either researchers have paid little or no attention to the topic, or there has been also little attention coming from the government. That could be an academic gap. Or theoretically also, the situation still intensified, and government has done nothing to placate this problem. So you are bringing analysis, tracing analysis. That is why it should entail not more than three paragraphs. Some people will say a page, but it should not exceed more than two pages, because it's a statement of a problem. You have to raise the gaps in the research you have identified, then you also can give what you call an amicable solution or amicable solutions with respect to that particular topic. So it's a matter of creating gaps in the research, identifying problems in the research, and giving also a remedy or solution or solutions to the problem. That is all what statement of the problem is about. So it should not exceed two pages. And I prefer always a page or three paragraphs. That is for your statement of the problem. Now what's the next step from there? We have to go to aims to objectives of the study. Now sometimes some researchers or some scholars, you know, academics, we say aims, stroke objectives of the study. They write it aims, stroke objectives of the study. But looking at it from other arguments in other quarters, Really, scholars have decided that they should not use the word aims, stroke objectives of the study. But you have to write aim, stroke objectives of the study. Now, let me give you a clear distinction between aim and that of objectives. They might be interwoven, but they are distinction. When you talk about aim, you are talking about a topic sentence. So you should not say aims, sentence. So that is why it should be separated from objectives. So when you have written that word, aims to objectives of the study, you can start by saying, the aim, or some people say the main aim, the main aim, or the aim of this topic is to investigate the causes of prostitution in western part of Freetown. So you see, that is your topic sentence. So the aim always should be your topic sentence. So you cannot say aims, but you have to say aim. So that is why when you have written aims to objectives of the study, you can deal with the aim first before coming to the objectives by saying the aim, or some will say the main aim of this topic is to examine, is to investigate. Then you state your topic sentence. That is the aim I'm talking about. So it's from the aim that you have what? The objectives, or what you call the stated objectives. In other words, the aim could just be an umbrella. 
So it is from the A, you get what? Your objectives, that could be referred to segment of variables under the A. So the aim of this topic is to investigate the causes of prostitution in the western part of Freetown. Then what are the objectives? You are not taking your objectives from the aim you have stated. In order, you are breaking down that aim into particles or into segments. That is what we said. Aim is your topic sentence. Objectives. You are getting your objectives from the aim. In other words, you are extracting from the aim, or some people will call it the main aim. The aim is your topic sentence. The aim of this topic is to investigate, you state your topic. That should be your aim, precisely. Now, you get the objectives from the aim. It's just like you are extracting from the aim. You are breaking down the aim or the topic sentence into particles or segments. Those are the objectives I'm talking about. Or they are the objectives I'm talking about. Now, the aim of this research is to investigate, you state your topic, to investigate, for example, the causes of prostitution in the western part of Freetown. That is your topic sentence, which is your dissertation. The specific objectives are or include color. So you are now extracting from the aim or from that topic sentence, the aim. You are now breaking the aim into what we call segments or particles. These are the objectives we are talking about. And sometimes students ask, how many objectives should we have in the research? Some scholars will answer you that it depends on the topic. No, it does not depend on the topic. Your objectives should always be five. Five objectives. The five objectives. In other words, after stating the aim, you go to the objectives. Some of them can even give it sub, you know, points. For example, they will say 1.30 aim stroke objectives of the study. 1.301, 1 1.3, 1.3.1 is the objectives you are talking about. These are objectives. So the aim of this research is to investigate. The specific objectives are as follow or are cool up or include you state now. Now among all the five objectives you are stating, what is paramount I'm concerned about are the remaining three objectives. That is objective third, fourth, and fifth. Take cognizance, objectives, third, fourth, and fifth. Causes, if ever you are talking about causes, as a language used in your topic, you can modify it. But causes should be there, pass as a third objective. After causes, you may have what you call effect. It could be an appalling effect, it depends. Then of course, you may have what you call challenges. The challenges normally go with the last objective, which is a remedy or solutions. So don't forget that even if you are not stating the causes of the problem, but take cognizance of what? The effect, that is the it impact on the society. You look at that one, one variable, the impact on the society. You look at the challenges a researcher is faced with. What are the challenges? Then the last objective should be what? 
the solutions. For example, I will state that one of the objectives of this topic, an examination of the causes of prostitution in the western part of Syria. You look at the first objective. Pass in your investigation, what are the main causes of prostitution in the western part of that particular country or in that particular locality? Yeah, another objective perhaps you look at, what are some of the appalling effects on the society? So you can say, for example, in, object, in one of the objectives, to examine the causes of prostitution in the western part of Sierra Leone. Another objective, to identify the appalling effect of prostitution on that particular society. Another objective. To discuss some of the appalling effects of prostitution on that particular society. To analyze or elucidate the challenges faced by respondents in that particular society, then your last objective, to give appropriate remedies to minimize prostitution in that particular society. So I'll give you about three or four objectives. So it depends on the topic, but at the same time, those effects, should, those variables should be there you look at the effect, that is its impact on the society, you look at the challenges, and you look at what? The remedies to address. Those three key sentences should be clearly stated if you're excluding causes. They are prominent in that particular objective. So you are stating five objectives. Excluding the aim. You have already stated the aim. That is why it is clearly indicated aims to objectives of the study. So the aim of this research is to investigate the causes of prostitution in the western part of Freetown. The specific objectives include, colon, you state them to examine, to identify, to discuss, to elucidate. You state those five objectives. Those are the objectives of the study. Now looking at it from research has types, we have types of research. Looking at it from the triangulation point of view, that is a qualitative and quantitative aspect of a research. Normally I advise my students, I normally tell them, I used to tell them to be candid enough. I say you are in the social science stream, this is social sciences and law. Therefore, you are expected to bring about what you call Research questions. Supervisors will tell you that since you have stated the five objectives, you are not supposed to go to research questions. Well, as you, especially in the honors class, I always advise that you look at the objectives of the study as well as research questions. Aim stroke objectives of the studies, when you have gone through that one, the next subtopic should be research questions. Objectives of the study is almost the same with research questions. They are interwoven, I mean, they are almost the same. The only difference you can identify is that in research questions, you are formulating it in the form of questions. In other words, the objectives you have stated five earlier, you ask me those objectives, transform it there now in form of questions. That's the distinction between objectives of the study and that of what research questions. For example, in one of the objectives I mentioned, 
to examine the causes of prostitution in the western part of Freetown. If I'm formulating that one in the form of a research question, I will ask the question, what are the main causes of prostitution in the western part of Syria? Deal? If I was looking at the appalling effect to examine the appalling effect of prostitution on the society as one of what my objectives, I will formulate that one in the form of questions. What are some of the appalling effects of prostitution on the society? So all what is needed here, we are saying, is formulating questions with respect to the stated objectives. That is why sometimes some you know, supervisors will tell you, I don't need a risk, I don't need research questions, because already you have stated your five objectives. But I prefer that you give me objectives of the study as well as research questions. Why? Because I may want to test your academic ability. How best you can formulate a question with respect to the objective. So it is test. It is not an hypothesis. It could be an hypothesis. It is to test the ability of the student. How best the student can explore his creative knowledge in formulating those stated objectives. Those are, those are research questions. Those are research questions. So you give the objectives of the study which has to go in line with research questions. That is all what research question is about. From that area, some would say you go to limitations and delimitations of the study. Some will say you give first significance of the study or justification of the study before tackling delimitation and limitation of the study. But to be candid enough, you must have to state the scope of the study. So you will look at delimitation and that of limitations. They are quite different, these variables. Students confused there. Delimitation here we are talking about. It is limited. You are limited to a particular society where the researcher is undertaking, you know, embarking on the what? On the work. Delimitation tells you about the area you are going to cover. Some people put it in that term, scope of the study. But delimitation, if you are talking about Calvert Town, you are talking about Wellington, you are talking about Kenima, you are talking about Kailan or Makini, those areas, or what is located, what is indicated in your research as your case study, should be your delimitation of the study. This research covers, for example, free time. If free time is your case study. That is your delimitation. This study covers Freetown, which is the capital, Freetown, capital city of Syria. So that is your delimitation. Now, it does not stop there. You give a short background of that locality. Freetown is a capital city of Syria, which has identified identical or homogeneous culture. And the dominant tribes in Freetown are Mende, Simni, Loko, Lima, etc., etc. You look at the tribe. You look at the tribe, the dominant tribe. Their occupation, their occupation, or the major occupation of these tribes are, instead, it's about fishing, farming. You chronologically state those things out in your delimitation. So delimitation covers the area specifically located in your research. And you have to give a short analysis of synopsis of that of your, your area. So that scholars, researchers, and other people outside will know a historical background of that area. You are not going to detail. You are giving a summary of it. And some people normally attach what you call a map to it. For example, the map of Freetown. To show apparently that this is the area I'm doing the, the research. But the map you are giving should be original one. 
Some normally go to the textbook, plagiarize a map of Sierra, plagiarize a you know, map of Rita, etc., as the case may be, and indicate or attach that one to the delimitation. Some people even argue that delimitation can be applied in chapter 3. But it must, if you want, it should be in chapter 1. So delimitation is the area you targeted, the area you are going to target in your research, the area which is your case study, the case study of that research is your delimitation we are talking about. So it entails, once more, short background of that particular town, Take a cognizance of what? Dominant tribes, occupation, and if possible, you attach a map illustrating the activities of those people. That is delimitation. So normally, is there delimitation? Stroke what? Limitations of the study. Now, limitations of the study, there have been also contentions even among scholars and academics when you talk about limitations of the study. What limited you in the research whilst undertaking the research? What were some of the obstacles, major problems that you envisage? Now, some people may ask a question. I have not gone through the research. How will I state the problems? I have not gone through the research. I have not done my dissertation. So, therefore, how will I give limitations to the study? This is all about foresight. You forecast, you envisage. What do you think you will encounter when you are doing the research? That is your limitations. What limited your exercise? What limited this research? What are the constraints? What are the problems likely you have to encounter? When some people will talk about finance, lack of transportation, lack of finance, they can go to the textbook and plagiarize exactly from other dissertation books how finance or how transportation gave them a problem. I don't consider those as limitations. They are no limitations. But to make today work very easy, we accept them. But they are no limitations. These are problems. They are inevitable. You are a student. You must have to encounter transportation. So they are not problems. They are not constraints per se as a research. Because you are expected as a student to you know, bring to encounter those problems. So I don't consider them as limitations. Yet, today, to make work easier, we accept them as limitations. But looking at limitations, what are limitations? For example, if you are undertaking a research, let's say, at the University of Sierra Leone, or let's say, in Freetown here, a typical example, like what is happening now currently. Constraints are those impediments that you cannot control beyond your control. You can combat transportation. You can combat also what? You know, typing of your dissertation. So that's why they are not constraints. These are elementary constraints. But for example, if you are talking about constraints here or limitations in the research, you can look it either globally or you can look it also, you know, from a theoretical perspective. It can be natural, it could be artificial. For example, present and what I'm expecting students to write as one of the major constraints is the outbreak of this COVID-19. That could be a constraint. So it's an impediment you cannot control. Those are constraints we are talking about. But finance, you can combat that one. See, that is a constraint. Then also you look, for example, if you are taking a research, for example, an examination of, uh, let's say, sexual harassment, you know, in universities, you take a case study from a college, sexual harassment could be either by lecturers or even by students, so it is comparative. So you look at one particular sector, if you are looking at the lecturers sexually harassing or students sexually harassing lecturers, and now let's say you are undertaking a research in that particular area, then it happens there is a riot or strikes or anything on you know upheaval or something like a riot in a university campus, and your library is located there and the supervisor stays there in the quarter. 
These are problems, you have to mention them as constraints. You might say because of the outbreak of what? Strikes, riots, student riots. These are constraints. Some people will even say also language barrier. Okay, language barrier is not a constraint because you must have an interpreter. So when you talk about constraints, you are talking about things you cannot control as a whole. So delimitation, you give what? The area you are going to study. Limitations, the constraints or limitations you are faced with while undertaking the project. Your constraints, another aspect of chapter one is the significance of the study. In other words, some people will say justification of the study. The research you are undertaking, how justifiable it is. How justifiable. Significance tells you about is about the importance of the study to the researcher, to the society, and even to other scholars or academics. But you are more targeting the society. But that is a fundamental departure of dissertation and project writing. Because dissertation is purely academic. And project, it could be a write-up, either for funding or anything that would be paramount to the beneficiaries. In projects, we'll be talking about the beneficiaries. In research, we'll be talking about respondents. So look at those variables, those terms, terminologies. As I said, justification, how justifiable the research you are taking. It's a fundamental departure between project writing and that of dissertation. Significance of the study, how this study is really important to the general world. So holistically, we are looking at it. They look at it specifically in line with your domain or the area that you are going to cover. The target of the story. So justification or significance of the study, for example, how far do you think the study is justifiable to the respondents living in that particular society, to the academics, other researchers, and even also to you as a student, whether in your faculty, in your department? It depends. Some people will put them in paragraphs. Paragraph one, paragraph two, paragraph three, four, five, six, as the case may be. Some will identify it by bullet points, giving bullet points. The significance of this study may be discussed below. One bullet point. This study will be important, for example, to the ministry, if you are talking about the department or sector, to the ministry of social affairs or to the ministry of education, how you justify, you cannot just end there. The study we serve a profound impact on the respondents living in this particular society because they will utilize it to bring about other developmental programs. Or it could be used by the Ministry of Education to sensitize, educate young girls, ladies about the appalling effect of prostitution in a particular society. It exposes, for example, the social vices or crudities of the society. 
So you can give analysis of them using paragraphs of bullet points. The significance of the study. It will also, the material you are writing, or this dissertation, it will be used for us here in the Department of Sociology, Social Work, as a reference point. It will also be useful to academics or scholars who may want or intend to take similar research in that discipline. So justification of the study or significance of the study, you are justifying your dissertation. On what grounds? You look at the merits. You look at the significance of the study to the researcher, to, the, to academics, to the society as well. So it depends. You can give six points, you can give six paragraphs, but do not write extensively because you are writing, putting them in paragraphs. This is the justification of the study we are talking about. The next stage, some people call it the definition of terms. But that one has been modified as what? Not definitions of terms. Definition of terms. But definition of operational terms. Operational terms. Operational terms. There are key words you may have to encounter when you're writing your dissertation. Students also often ask this question. How will I define those terms when I have not gone through the dissertation? That is, I have not written chapter 1, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Then how will I give definition of those key terms? Definition of operational terms. That should be definition of operational terms. Well, I used to tell them that you have not gone through chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or you have not completed the dissertation yet. At the same time, you may envisage some of the terminologies or terms that you have to encounter when writing your dissertation. For example, if you are looking at an investigation of the causes of prostitution in the western part of Freetown, you must have to define what a prostitution is. You must have to define what an immorality is. You must have to define some other terms. But in actual fact, in fact, some people they just at that particular stage identify five or six terms they have already encountered in chapter one. And as the dissertation progresses, that is going through chapter two, chapters two, three, four, they can bring in more terms. How are you going to look at those terms? You look at them from the theoretical aspect. You are not looking at the terms in the context they are used. It could be theoretical or practical. For example, if I look at morality, or I look at prostitution, definition of operational terms, as I said, you define precisely the meaning of a particular word. For example, franchise. You look, check Oxford Dictionary, Give just a meaning. You are not going to do a thorough research or give two, three pages on, for example, franchise or democracy. Just a precise definition, exact to the point. But I said, yeah, normally we have a point of departure with other disciplines, other disciplines like medicine and that of law. You give a medical term to a world. Medical dictionary is there. You can take that one when, if you are doing medicine, engineering also has a loose professional causes. Law, for example, if you are talking about pleadings, you are talking about drafting, you have to give a technical or a legal meaning to those who are pleadings, drafting, are free. You check your law dictionary and give a precise meaning to the world. So operation of terms, there is no limit to it. You can give 12, 
14, 14 terms and define it precisely. Some people go beyond also to look at dissertation structure. I don't look at it very important because some of them we argue that dissertation structure. Now you have to summarize all what you have written in chapter one. What is details, variable, you know, details, analysis, or those variables you have identified in chapter one. You see, you summarize them using a heading dissertation structure. I'm looking at it that it's a waste of time. Why? Because when you go back to your chapter 5, here we'll be talking about summary, conclusion, and recommendations. You can bring that on under 5.1. Summary. You have summary, conclusion, and that of what recommendations. So dissertation structure, as far as I'm concerned, is unrelevant. You are duplicating the world. So operation of terms should always end chapter 1. Nothing else. So in summary, this work is beneficial to my final year students through the college in sociology and social work department who are now engaged in writing of their dissertation. You can use this work to review your chapter one Make the necessary corrections because I've gone through chapters one and two of the work. There are so many errors I identify. But looking at this one, we pinpoint some of the areas you need to focus on when you are writing a dissertation. This is what I call is an applied research. It's an applied research. This work also will be useful to almost one student and third year who are doing research and other departments as well. Not only targeting for Bay College, but other tertiary institutions who are equally engaged at this moment writing your dissertation. Once we study Sotamara, lecturer at Ruby College, BA Education, LAB Honors, Masters in Education, Masters in Sociology, and a PhD candidate at the Probe College. I thank you very much for listening. Our next topic will be looking at Chapter 2, How to Write Literature Review. I thank you all. God bless you.